Career success doesn't always depend on prior experience, a college degree, or inside connections. Achieving great career heights is possible through making a conscious effort to uncover opportunities that will add value and earn recognition from higher ups. Well, let's have ourselves a pocket-sized pep talk and meet a man whose meteoric rise over 26 years took him from an entry-level position to CEO. A pocket-sized pep talk, the podcast that can help energize your business and your life with a quick, inspiring message. Now, here's your host, Rob Jollis. Today's guest, Ted Clark, is a businessman, entrepreneur, and investor with more than 40 years experience as a senior executive. He now consults with business managers on acquisitions and growth strategies, and his book, Shipping Clerk to CEO, The Power of Curiosity, Will, and Self-Directed Learning, chronicles his incredible journey, and that's a journey I want to hear about. Welcome to the show, Ted. Great. Thanks, Robert. Great to be on on with you. You bet. Well... Pleasure to have you here, so let's get to work. All right, well, yours was a meteoric rise, and I'm a process guy. I I, I like to process those types of behaviors. So we got a lot of people listening in right now, and they want to create that type of excitement and rise for themselves. Give me one or two process behaviors that right off the bat might come from that book of yours that they could uh, implement to try and at least move them through uh, uh, the companies they're working with. Yeah, sure. Th- thanks, Robert. Uh, great to be on, great to be on with you. Um, yeah, so you know, as I said, I mean, I started as a 19-year-old uh, kid, you know, just you know, not too long out of high school, you know, long, long blonde hair, tall and skinny, and uh, you know, not really looking for a career, but looking for a job to buy a new pair of skis and boots to, for the next ski season. And uh, and I just uh, you know just happened to fall in love with the shop floor and. Um, and, you know, pretty quickly when I was there, I, I started to try and think about ways I could make my job more interesting. So, uh, and although it wasn't intentional then, when I look back at it, it was, it was sort, of, um, sort of three things, right? I would sort of envision how I could improve things. And then I would, uh, you know, sort of, you know, develop a, a, kind, of a kind of a set of objectives, like, what does that mean? You know, how, how, you know, you know, how do you know you've improved it? Uh, and then I would develop sort of a strategy and a set of tactics. And, uh, you know, probably the one thing that was instrumental really early on is I would get calls in the shipping department and people would ask me if, where their orders were. And if it wasn't there, all, all I had to really do is say yes or no, right? It's in, it's in shipping, I'm going to ship it, or it's not here, you got to go look somewhere else. Uh, and after I did that a few times, I decided uh, when they called us, I said, look, at, um, I, you know, I'm driving my forklift around, I'll go find this order for you when I'm, you know, and I'll call you back, right? So I started to do extra things early on that were adding value to my colleagues, right? So this sort of idea of kind of collaborating with people and sort of developing solutions uh, is something that I've done really right through to uh, right through to today. Yeah, I, and you know, it's it's impressive to me that um, you you know you, I call it measurements. You know that you're putting measurements on what you do. There's so many people out there that. Uh, they're what we call unconscious competence frequently, or um, sometimes they're unconsciously incompetent, but they're not aware of the tasks they're doing. And one of the things that I think I hear out of you is um, to be a little bit more measured in what you're doing. Uh, there's an old saying that, that says, um, you know, when you can measure something, you can fix it. And so um, would it be safe to say that what I'm pulling out of that answer of yours is that a lot of your behaviors, you were at least trying to put some sort of measurements on what you were doing so that you, you know, you know, if it works and you could repeat it or, you know, if it doesn't work and you can change it. Am I on base? Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, that, that was, that was, that was a thing, right? So, you know, to me, it was putting, you know, kind of putting points on the board, right? So to do that, you have to, you have to understand, you know, what it is you were trying to do, but then how do you, how do you create a metric around that where, you know, you can go to, go to somebody and say, look, I was able to do this and, you know, this process is now working better and I want to work on something else now. Right. So I want to do something, you know, uh, different to help, help improve the, uh, improve the process or the company or whatever you're doing. And, uh, and, you know, and it kind of, again, it kind of equates into those four things. Right. So, you know, you can't, you know, you have to have a vision, right? So the creativity comes from the vision, but the vision's no good unless you have really a clear set of objectives to measure yourself against, right? So that you know that you actually got to where you thought you were, you know, what, what you envisioned in the first place. And then it really helped uh, distill the idea of the difference between strategy and tactics. And, uh, 
And, you know, for me, that was, that was really the key thing. I think once people started to see, I was really competent in sort of looking beyond the sort of, you know, status quo process and into more of a change process, you know, people will give you more opportunities to do things. And that's, that's what I found anyway. So. Yeah. Now I'm curious, did um, the, the companies you were working for, did they have these processes in place and you were just kind of implementing what you were being taught or were you, I don't want to say going rogue, but were you kind of creating your own sort of system and process? Yeah, I, I was, I, I, I was going a little rogue in those days, to be honest with you. It was, uh, so the way I viewed it was look at, um, uh, you know, I, I would learn a process, right? So you have to learn the process that's there. And then you have to start thinking about, well, you know, what's frustrating you about this process? Like, you know, you know, and, and usually it was a little bit more selfish, right? It's like, you know, this frustrates me. So I want to make my job a little bit easier. How can I improve my job? And so I would just do it sometimes. In fact, most of when I, when I was uh, younger, I would, I would just sort of take the initiative and do these things. And, you know, sometimes people would, would be upset and you know sometimes people would go wow that's you know that's really good initiative right but but it's another thing I talk about in my book uh, a lot is you know having a little courage right you know a lot of times people are afraid to you know it's easy to to understand the problem or to know what a problem is but it's it's harder to actually fix it um, and in a lot of places you have to get a lot of permission to try and change a process so you know sometimes just changing it and then explaining it later is is, is better than, than, than trying to sort of sort of take it through the uh, whatever the, you know, the decision making system is. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I what I'd like to do is I'd like to shake the hand of some of the managers you worked with, because you had some you really did. You had some quality. I, I, I never met him, but I'm telling you right now, you had some pretty gutsy managers because there are a lot of companies where when somebody's saying, you know, I'm I'm trying to improve my department. And so I've got these ideas and I'm going to implement them. And we'll see how well they work. Some corporations that doesn't fly. Uh, you know, I, I came from Xerox. Uh, it certainly didn't fly at Xerox. But the good news was, and you would have fit in real well, Ted, is that we were taught quality improvement processes, problem solving processes, how to meet as a group. And then we were tasked on our own. This was not part of our nine to five job to form quality families and to do exactly what you just described as a group but with process behaviors behind us. So when we brainstorm, we brainstorm properly. When we, when we implemented an idea, we already had an as is desired state. We were following process behaviors. We'd put on presentations on the processes that we went through. And all we were trying to do was improve the company, but we were doing it culturally. We weren't on our own. Yours was a more courageous <laughs> angle. <laughs> You just were going out on your own and trying to tackle what what can make me and this position, this job better. Um, and that's why I, I, I do. I want to meet your managers because I had a few that would be like, oh, no, 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 we're not doing that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's I mean, it's another, you know, and I when I reflect back and in, in, in why I was able to move from a shipping clerk to a CEO, you know, one of the, one of the most important things were the mentors I had along the way. Right. So I had some really great mentors and. You know, I tell a lot of people that I mentor now is that, you know, what what the mentor wants to see from you is initiative and trying things and 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 not being defensive. Right. So, you know, when you did something wrong, you know, you're going to get corrected. Right. So but if you don't do anything, you don't have the chance to be corrected. Right. So so part of this is is it's sort of a two a two sided uh, a deal here where, you know, if you have a, a mentor that gives you a little bit of rope. Let, let you make a few mistakes, but doesn't let you get too far out there, right? So, this was uh, like really important, in, you know, in my development because I didn't, have, you know, I didn't have a degree, you know, I was very raw, uh, and and I just, I just, I just wanted to, um, you know, I was just curious and wanted to be involved in things, and uh, you know, having a certain kind of boss. Because you're right, there, there were, and there were people in our company that uh, that I worked for actually that that weren't, you know, that that, that weren't that way, right? That would you know, really didn't want to explain things to you, really didn't want to help you that much. Uh, some were a little bit, you know, maybe they were afraid for their job or whatever, but, but I was fortunate. I had, I had enough people and then I was doing well enough where people above them would sort of see it. And then it would, you know, sort of something was in my way. They sort of helped me navigate that. Yeah. And I think you hit on a big piece there. I, I wish people were uh, understood how important this is. 
mentors are so important and there's no mentor course. There's, there's no mentor one-on-one in college. You didn't miss anything. Uh, and yet the right mentor can completely reshape a career and a life. Uh, and, um, I, I don't, you know, I've, I've had a few myself. My father was, was my mentor. I was one of my mentors, but in business, I had one, um, I'll, I'll call him out every time. Larry Demoncus living in North Carolina on Lake Larry, as I call it. Uh, but, but, uh, just a wonderful guy who really uh, put me under his wing there. And, uh, but without mentors, I just wonder how people succeed and it's not an instinctive move. And I wish it was to go find yourself a mentor and, and, and vet those mentors out. <laughs> They're not all created equally. Uh, but, um, I think that was an important part of the, of the puzzle that we're putting together on you of, of how you went through this rise, the right mentors. Yeah, I- exactly. And, uh, you know, I, um, you know, uh, I, I often look back at, 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 and, you know, as an example, I mean, you know, you, you bring up Xerox, you know, uh, my, my first mentor who was really my most important one, he realized I wasn't a very good salesman when I, you know, I'd, I'd moved up a few, few, uh, positions and they wanted to put me in sales and I was horrible. And I actually asked him to take me out of sales and uh, which they did for a while. And then, uh, he said, well, look, I want to send you to a Xerox sales training course. Right. So I, I went to that and, uh, and I know you'll be very familiar with this. They had a process called need satisfaction selling. Right. And yep. it just turned the light on for me. I mean, it was, it was the most impactful, uh, course that I've ever been on because it just changed the whole way that I thought about, uh, selling and even really strategy and business, right? So it's all about the sort of, you know, listening, uh, uh, understanding, and then and then presenting a value proposition to the customer, you know, that that would that would help them solve their problem, but uh, but 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 do it in a way that created real value for them, and uh, that and that was uh, you know really one of the most important things that I I've, I've done in my in my you know forty plus year career was that uh, Xerox sales training course. You're making a friend of, of with me. Uh, who knows? I may have taught you that course because I did teach that <laughs> course and a few others for Xerox. Uh, did they? Uh, did you get a laminated card when you took that course? Do you remember with the process you know, on it? It was. You know, this was a long time ago. It was. In, it was I, I was trying to think about this uh, before I got on the call. I think it was sort of like nineteen, maybe nineteen seventy eight, nineteen seventy nine. Uh, uh, it was in Chicago, and uh, I think we did. And I, I you know, and, and at the time it was sort of sort of groundbreaking back then because they would record you. So you do the, and the role playing was really the thing, right? So where you'd probe and, and listen and probe and listen, and ask open ended questions. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, you know, it would, you know, technology then was, you know, that was a big deal. And uh, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was terrific. It really was. I can't tell you, Ted, how many times in my career, I finished delivering a keynote of some sort, come off a stage and somebody will come up moving a little slow uh, yeah. and they'll come up and they'll go, you know, back in the seventies, <laughs> I went to, and they'll reach into their pocket. They'll open up their wallet and they'll pull out a tattered and torn laminated card uh, because yeah. Xerox is very process oriented. They love those laminated cards. And when I went, yeah. when I left Xerox 30 years ago, first thing I did was create a laminated card. I didn't use it all that much, but I thought I, I must have a laminated card. I'm a, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I bleed blue X's. I got I got to get myself a card. But, you know, car, the card aside, uh, we, we take our hat off to a Xerox or any company that, again, at least created a culture of selling that said uh, they, our process won't be get them to buy, sell them and then sell another one. Uh, or as a former insurance salesman and love the insurance industry, I'm a proud New York life guy. But my process was two a week, 10 a month, and don't let me catch you in the bullpen. Uh, you know, that was our sales process. Xerox really did, as you mentioned, open-ended probes. And, and you know, you threw out the word listening. People go, yeah, yeah, listening. You know how many times I, I, I walk around, I'm going around the country with tape recorders and said, okay, sell something. Nobody's really doing all that much listening. So just to slow down and process that out makes sense. Let's stay there for a minute. Uh, because you're not going to get an argument from me about sales, but you're kind of an interesting guy because you you weren't exactly you know uh, you know loving the concept of selling, and yet you embraced it, you went through it, and it sounds like you got a lot out of it. 
I'd like you to talk about that for a moment, because I know we have a lot of people listening that are saying, oh, no, I, I don't really sell. I'm just a manager. <laughs> uh, 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 talk to those people a little bit as a person who wasn't naturally a salesperson and what you got out of it and what maybe they should be getting out of it. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, um, well, first of all, it, it, you know, it it um, it uh, resonated with me because because I was shy then. Right. I mean, I was, you know, I mean, like a lot of people, I was shy and, you know, and selling, you know, whether we like it or not, sort of got that thing. Well, you know, you got a bigger and bigger than life personality and all that stuff. And uh, and the idea of, of sort of listening and and asking questions and creating a relationship a relationship that then was was intentional right so so you'd come back with your response to all that which is which is really creating influence right so you're influencing people to you know you've, you've used what they've told you to, to find a solution to give to them and influence them in a certain way right and you know i tell people all the time is you know selling is not just an external thing or, or selling products if, you know if you're really going to be going to build a business you need to know how to sell right if you're going to be a great manager or a great leader you need to know how to sell ideas and concepts and to your point you know as i as i evolved right you know you know sort of add to the things i talked about before sort of vision and you know uh objective strategy and tactics just really this idea of building a culture so that as businesses get bigger you get people to behave in a way that's consistent with your culture, right? So, you know, the way that you, you know, the ethics that you want in the company, the, you know, the, you know, the esprit de corps, the, the, the you know, the risk taking, the level of risk taking that you want people to understand that they can take to make your company, you know, a different, uh, you know, than your best competitors, right? So I always tell people, you know, you wanna be just marginally better than your best competitor. And if you can do that, you can do it consistently, you know, you're going to have a, you know, you're going to be able to develop a successful business. And the core to all that is this sort of idea of selling and getting people to believe that, right? So, you know, one of the, one of the core tenets of leadership is, you know, you get like, you get like really smart people. And, you know, I've always tried to get people smarter than me on my teams, but it, but if, but if you let them sort of go, they're going to go in all kinds of different directions and, and trying to pull people around, uh, you know, kind of a vision, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a, a structure where they can go out and they can apply their gifts to your enterprise the way that you want to build it, um, you know, is, is, you know, is, is sort of the core to being, you know, being a CEO really in the end is, you know, how do you, how do you get, you know, get people to really go to a place that you, you know, you think you want to take the company? Yeah. Well, and you know, that's, that's the basic definition of selling to me. It's taking your idea, putting it in somebody else's brain and making them feel like they thought of it. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and that I'm just summing up your answer there. Oh, yeah. Bingo, Ted, bingo. Yeah. The book is shipping clerk to CEO, the power of curiosity, will and self-directed learning. Okay. One other really important part of selling and you've nicked it a couple of times is trust. Um, and in your book, you write about that a little bit about how it's, um, given and earned. And uh, so, so, um, uh, you know, I'm a believer that you earn trust. Uh, but, but that's it. And, and, and I got to tell you, I'm going to be listening hard to this answer, because as a guy who writes sales books, one of the hardest things to do is process the move of trust. In other words, we can process an opening tactic, we can put a process on objections handling, we could even create urgency and follow a process quality improvement problems. So, but trust is a little bit vague, in a sense. So let's just spend a moment there because without trust, we're not going to get real far into the selling process. So take a swipe at it, Ted, maybe from your book a little bit. Talk to me about how you process or at least some of the tips you'd provide to help somebody create trust with another human being. Yeah, sure. Um, well, yeah, I know for, well, for me in particular, uh, particularly when I started, right, you know, again, I was always like, you know, sort of young and new and doing something different. And, uh, you know, you go tackle a problem with a customer and, you know, uh, you know, the customer would come back and say, well, you know, I've had, I've had people in your company three levels up from you come in and tell me they were going to do these same kinds of things. And, you know, how can I trust you or why, you know, you know, what makes you more credible than, 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 than those folks. And, and, uh, and, you know, I, I always sort of started with, well, look at, you know, I, I'm here to tell you sort of what, I would like to do to try and, you know, earn your trust, right? But I'm not, I'm not actually asking you to trust me right now, right? I want to build a process where 
you know, if I do this, this, and this, and I do it consistently, consistently with you, that that we'll build, you know, we'll build a relationship together. Well, you, you know, where you'll give me your trust, right? So I, I think this whole idea of earned trust is really is it is really important, particularly when you're young, and you're developing, right? To to your point about giving trust, that's a different that's a different thing, right? And um, you know, I I tend to start, and I mean, I, I don't know if I'm right or wrong on this, but I tend to start with trusting people, right? So I I tend I'm not really that skeptical. If somebody tells me they're going to do something, I'm just going to accept it but I'm gonna hold them accountable to what they told me they were gonna do, right? So if for some reason they don't do what they said they were gonna do, it's incumbent upon me to say, look at, you know, you did pretty well there, but you told me you were gonna do this and you ended up doing this. So, you know, bring that together for me. Help, help me understand why we didn't get there. And, you know, maybe there's something I can do to help, you know, help you get there or whatever. But, but that sort of, sort of uh, you know, trust has got two things, right? It's got, you know, expectations and, and, and how you meet those expectations on both sides. And uh, I think that sort of basic thing of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important to, to, you know, to, to, to gain trust, but it's also important if you're trusting people to make sure you know when, when, when they're starting, when you're starting to lose their trust a little bit. Right. So, yeah. um, so it's, 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 it's not the easiest thing in the world. And, you know, again, I think the reason I like it and the reason it's been helpful for me is that, you know, if you can build a trusting relationship with your team um, and you can trust them with things, uh, you don't have to worry as much. Right. So and, and you know, the other thing that that I do, which is maybe a little bit different, is I'm not necessarily a perfectionist built around, you know, you know, uh, you know, it's important to have great processes. And I, I get all that. But every once in a while, people want to, you know, they want to, you know, you know, you set an objective and they might get to that objective a little bit different than maybe you'd envision them getting there. But if they got there and they accomplished it, it's good to actually sort of look at how they got there versus how you thought they should have gotten there and see if you can, you know, maybe their process is better than your process, right? So, so I do try to, I do try to give people, um, you, know, you know, the latitude to make these kind of choices, right? Yeah, you know, um, it's it's funny the the rogueness in you is coming out <laughs> of, of that last bit of your response. But you said something else to, that to me is really important. Um, you know, and, and I'm looking at you as a manager right now, um, or as a leader. It's to me, it's about communication. Whether I've done something right or whether I've done something wrong, to know where I stand allows me as an employee to trust you as a manager. The managers I never trusted were the ones I didn't know what they were thinking. I didn't know right. whether I was on. I, when I got called into the office, I, my heartbeat started picking up because I didn't know if this was going to be a good meeting or a bad meeting. Yeah. And that's dangerous to me. So, I, you know, what I'm taking away from your response is uh, that um, mini communication almost. I mean, that, that'd be a nice title for a book. You know, it, that we don't have to wait for the big talk. Let's just keep talking. Let's just keep when maybe I got there a different way. Maybe it was a good way, but but let's get at it while it's well. There's a small fire burning before it becomes a big fire, uh, because not only am I the employee uh, going to be there's going to be a lack of trust between us, but we got the rest of the team watching this too, and so and and teams talk. So um, I like the fact that I think you're either a conscious competent or an unconscious competent on on maintaining, you know, open communication lines. I think that's, that's the key that would create trust with between you and me uh, as an employee to, to a manager, you'd have my trust. If you did that, if I just knew what you were thinking, uh, the best yep. ones did it and the worst ones didn't. Let's do a 180. Let's we're coming down the home stretch. Let's talk about, I, I, I saw something else yours that I thought was, that made me laugh. Uh, you were talking about, uh, power walks how they can revolutionize uh the, your, your work presence big power walk guy i'm assuming T talk to me about that yeah well you know um you know i started to do it uh well you know i started in shipping and, and that was my first thing right i you know i'd, I'd drive my forklift around i'd find out information and i'd come back i'd call somebody in customer service and say you know your orders your orders over in production it'll be out tomorrow and i'll ship it the next day and and and, uh, and so I got used to that and, and I'm not a big, like sit in the office all day person. Right. So, 
I would, if I had a problem, I would just, I would literally just get up and go find the person I needed to talk to. Right. So I would go all up. And it was not just the, the plant I'd go into finance or I'd go into marketing or whatever and say, or accounts payable and receivable, whatever it might've been, and just go find the person and have a talk with them. Right. So that was, that was just, that was just a way for me to get things done more quickly. And you have to remember, you know, this is in the, you know, this is in the seventies, right? So, you know, there's just like sort of rotary telephones that you call, you know, the three number department number and no one would pick up anyways. So it was just simpler to just go walk and, and, and do all that. And, you know, I, I just got, it's interesting. I just got a note from somebody who read my book that I worked with and they recalled all that I did that. And they sent me a very nice note about how they thought that was such a, uh, important thing because I ended up knowing like everybody, right? I knew people, you know, everybody in manufacturing, everybody in planning, you know, all over the place. And it was another, I think, important thing in my development, right? Is because, you know, people saw me, right? So, and, you know, it's a little harder today, right? Because, you know, bigger corporations, you're, you know, everybody's, you know, working from home and all this, and it's harder to, to, to create those networking opportunities. But for me, that power walk was really like a big kind of networking opportunity to, you know, meet people and again, kind of create that trust. Right. So I'd go out there I was gonna and say you know, that. You know, just going to yeah. say that, Ted, yeah. you're, you're, you're hitting the trust button once again. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm counting how many times I took a power walk with any manager I had in my career. Oh, here I'm done. Zero. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I had a cup of coffee with one of them once. Yeah. But, but my heart was beating fast. I thought I was in trouble. So that one doesn't yeah. count either. But uh, I, I love I, I think that's a great idea. I've, I've, I've one thing I'm picking up from the CEOs that I'm getting on the show is uh, the ones that are successful, the ones that uh, are earning that trust with the team by doing things like that. Um, I, you know, it's funny, I, I, I'm supposed to do that with my wife too i keep wanting to you know bring her flowers twice a year and say see i did something big for you and she <laughs> says i don't need the big flowers just to, just a pat on the back and it's nice to see you today and you know i was thinking yeah. about you uh is is really what a human being wants and um i think as employees we you know, we not necessarily the flowers and the pat on the back but just those little mini communications are so very important the book is Shipping Clerk to CEO, The Power of Curiosity, Will, and Self-Directed Learning. Sounds like a great book. How's it doing? Uh, it's doing great. It was, uh, it was uh, number one in uh, uh, management leadership on Amazon for sort of the 50 or the 30 days that I, after I announced its release and for the, you know, the next 30 days after, uh, after it was released. And then I think you're done. You know, you're not a pre-release anymore. So. But uh, yeah, it's done. It's done. It's done. It's done. Uh, it's done pretty well. It's my first book. I know you've done. You've, you've written lots of books. It's my first book, so it's a new experience for me. But uh, but yeah, so far so good. Getting uh, getting some pretty good feedback from you know uh, you know that you know my uh, you know my network out there, which is good. relatively large. So yeah, it's been it's it's been an exciting kind of uh, fun um, sort of uh, sort of end of you know. Uh, you know, actually, it's almost 50 years since I started. I started in 1973 as a shipping clerk, so it's been a bit a long, long time. 73. <laughs> I uh, I'm a few years younger than you. I, I was uh, I think I was in junior high school. No, I was in high school. I would think I was about yeah, 10th okay. or 11th grade. Uh, and, and you have another book that might that's coming out in September. Yeah, I, I do. It's it's called uh, Buy and Build CEO. It's um, you know after I. Uh, you know, I became a CEO of this company after, you know, 22 years. And I was there for another four years until I uh, got sold to PPG, uh, PPG Industries. And I, I, I co-founded a, a, a business from a thesis that I developed around um, consol a consolidation strategy in the adhesives and sealants industry and sort of started with a, a small platform company doing about $35 million in sales and $5 million in EBITDA and over 14 years and uh, 19 uh, acquisitions built it up to about 700 million in sales and 140 million in EBITDA and sold it, uh, actually sold it three times at three private equity uh, sponsors through that period. Um, but the last time I sold it, I, I sold it for 1.6 billion to, uh, to HP Fuller Company, you know, where I'd actually stayed there for almost five years as, as chief operating officer there. So uh, 
Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting story about how to use private equity to sort of act, you know, sort of actualize a vision, right? So I had a vision to build a business. Uh, it was, it, you know, it wasn't a business that I could finance, so I needed I needed equity equity capital, and uh, and it's sort of a, a you know, the the lessons, uh, you, you, the things you need to know and learn to be able to partner with a private equity company and kind of kind of you know deliver on your own dreams of a business that you you know you might want to build. Well. Listen, folks. Um, you can pre. Can we pre-order it now? Yeah. I, yes, you can actually. It's uh, uh, it's available for pre-order on, Am on Amazon. Yeah. Oh, good. And do you have an author's page on Amazon? I uh, I believe I do. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it, uh, I think it's tedclarkauthor.com. Good. Oh, on, no, on Amazon. Yeah, I think it's Ted. If you, if you type in Theodore Clark or Ted Clark, I think it'll take you right there. All right. Well, we we'll put it up on the page uh, our show notes page here and. Um, uh, folks uh, go go do that that help an author out we, we like those pre-orders it changes the algorithm <laughs> for us so, so if it sounds like a great book to you go get it look at look at what power walks can do for you you see there you go <laughs> ted i'm very grateful to have had you on the show really enjoyed the conversation i uh, learned a couple of things I, I wish you'd been my manager is all i can tell you <laughs> um and uh but thanks so much for being on the show terrific thank you i really appreciate it robert thank you you bet. Well, we'll do it again as well as we can next time. Until then, stay safe. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and recommend it on iTunes, Outcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information on this show and Rob at Jollis.com. <laughs>